So I'd like to just uh, say that for those of the, you that don't know, I'm Keith Lee, the president of the Arena London branch. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all here this evening for this webinar presentation, which is actually the first presentation of our new season. Um, today's presentation is going to be Sandwich Plate Systems, a Structural Composite, and it's going to be given by Ian Nash, the business manager of SP Technology Limited. Um, a little bit about Ian. Ian is the marine and offshore business manager for SP Technology and works with a wide range of global clients advising on class approved composite structural steel repairs. With the SPS Technology team, Ian is on a quest to ensure composite structural repairs are seen as standard repair options and no longer a new technology. Ian has worked on projects globally with most of the oil majors and taken part in a number of maritime research and development projects. After studying engineering at A-level, Ian joined the Royal Navy and Ian qualified as a lead marine engineer on destroyers and studied marine engineering at Portsmouth University before beginning his 13 year tenure with SPS Technology. So we welcome you to uh, Rena, Ian, and we look forward to your presentation. So if we can hand over to you and uh, share your screen, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Maritime industry's approach to, craft, to vessel crack repair using composites. Structural maintenance on vessels is growing, both in terms of demand and complexity. This requires a new, innovative approach and an overhaul of decades-old approaches to vessel crack repair to unlock cost, time, environmental, and safety benefits. Repairing the cracks present on a vessel's critical structure components forms a key part of structural maintenance, which preserves asset integrity, ensures seafarer safety, and safe passage of cargo. The global shipping fleet is aging. New stress points are emerging on existing vessel structures as a result of retrofitting and refits. Work that is vital in prolonging the life of the vessel and ensuring cost-effective compliance with environmental regulations. These factors mean the demand for structural maintenance, including crack repairs, is greater and more complex than ever before. For many years, gouging and rewelding or crop and renewal techniques have been used to address cracks on vessels. While effective, the process involves extensive steel renewal, which is costly, time-consuming, and comes with a heightened risk and time out of service. With the average age of the world merchant fleet continuing to grow, as of last year, on average, it was 21 years old per vessel, there is a likely to be an increased scope for structural repairs to address vessel cracks, with associated costs and time out of service, both key concerns. Time out of service relevant to cracks in this presentation, talk about hull or fuel tanks specifically. In this presentation, we'll examine how the combination of these factors suggests an overhaul is required in the maritime industry's approach to vessel crack repair. While repair techniques have remained static for many years, structural composites offer a cost competitive alternative that's fast, non-destructive and delivers improved strength compared to conventional steel structures. There's three types that I've identified here on the slide. Uh, one is a temporary composite wrap repair. Damaged ships and offshore pipe structures can be repaired and protected against the effects of erosion, corrosion, and deterioration, while the wide range of polymer composites, with using a wide range of polymer composites, polymer technology has been used in temporary composite wrap repair and maintenance of metal products since the 60s. Tempor temporary composite patch repairs features an application of carbon and glass fiber mixed with epoxy resin or adhesive to damage surface. By curing, the resin hardens and permanently bonds to the surface, impregnating also the fibers that reinstate the strength of the damaged part. This creates a solid new layer of material that provides full water tightness. These repairs have been around again, probably about 35 years. And then we've got the sandwich plate system, which is a fully class approved permanent repair, strengthening an upgrading solution that has been used on marine structures for over 20 years. With SPS, two metal plates are bonded by a polyurethane core. 
Now, the picture that I've shown on this slide, um, none of those three uh, repairs will uh, solve that issue. Um, the crack related to an accident or a collision where it forms a dent or deformation in the ship's structure. There's a geometric misalignment of the support structure and a crack forms at the weakest link. Obviously, this is the worst case scenario. Steel ship structures can develop cracks as a result of their all welded construction or material imperfections, loading conditions, fatigue and corrosion as they operate in highly corrosive environments. Welded ship structures are susceptible to damage during its construction and operational life. Design inadequacies, material selection, material imperfections, improper welding, incorrect fabrication or poor workmanship are some of the probable causes for damages during construction while fatigue and corrosion are related to operations. These damages primarily manifest as cracks in the ship structure, either immediately after fabrication or launching or in due course of time. Crack formation or initiation appears inevitable or unavoidable given the uncontrolled variables involved in constructing, in constructing a welded ship structure along with other factors, including the use of high tensile steel strength so where do cracks come from? Cracks can develop during the ship's construction stage. Due to their size, for instance, hairline cracks may not be picked up during the construction and addressed. Under normal circumstances, these cracks may not affect the ship structure integrity, but when unforeseen event takes place like a collision with another ship or a grounding event or impact from docking during bad weather conditions, these existing cracks could propagate at a faster rate and lead to structural failure and compromise the integrity of the structure, whether it be the ship's hull or one of the ship's tanks. When a crack is found in a ship structure during a routine inspection, or in some case by chance from a keen-eyed marine engineer on their rounds, the first thought is, what caused the crack? Is this the only one in the area? Is the day-to-day -day operation of the ship contributing to the cause of the crack? And what do we do to address the crack? We need to stop it growing and we need to identify a suitable repair method so the same crack doesn't reappear after the repair has been completed. Accidents at sea in the past few decades have had a huge impact to the pollution and damage of marine life, in addition to the potential loss of life or potential loss of a ship at sea. Ships are designed and built to such stringent standards of safety and pollution prevention and extensive inspections during construction and while they're in service. So there's lots of safety measures in place already. Despite these safety measures, accidents continue to happen, sometimes with catastrophic consequences. Almost 40 to 60% of the accidents involving cargo ships are due to collision or grounding accidents. Human errors in operating and manning these ships is one of the primary reasons for the accidents. This exceeds other causes such as technical or mechanical failures, design issues, and environmental conditions. The shipping industry has to be cautious towards accidents as there's no such insignificant leak which is acceptable anymore. In an extreme event such as a collision or a grounding accident as a result of human errors or not, a high level of redundancy will be crucial in limiting the extent of the damages to the ship's hull and the potential for further unexpected consequences. If you look at a ship's life for cracks you say the first five years as a ship comes out of construction, midlife will be six to maybe 10 years, 11 years. And then later on in life, we'll look at the last 10 years of a 20 year design life ship. Cracks reduce the local strength of the structure and compromise the tank leak integrity and structural integrity of the hull by increasing the global stress. These deficiencies may eventually lead to a rupture or fracture of the structural member over a period of time if neglected. Nevertheless, not all these cracks are serious, primary, primarily because ships are very redundant and the tolerance is a function of the overall structural redundancy, ductility and fracture toughness of the structural components. Cracks are not easily detectable. They can go unnoticed during routine inspections, especially during the early period of a ship's life when the perception is that the ship is brand new out of the box, so nothing should be wrong with it. But once a crack is formed, it spends almost 80% of its lifetime in the region of a short crack before it finally starts to propagate fast, leading to failure. Repair of cracks involves cost and time, and given a ship's charter commitments, it may not be possible to repair cracks 
on a priority basis once they're identified. Under such circumstances, the focus has always been to determine the control, determine and control crack growth conditions before final failure. NDE or non-destructive examination can be used for finding subsurface cracks, but can be expensive and time consuming. Other elements of visual inspection can be surface cleanliness, lighting level, inspector stress or viewing distance. Once a crack has been found, a repair procedure, depending on the severity and location of the crack, must be put in place. A newly built ship is expected to be crack free and cracks are unlikely to be caused by operational issues such as corrosion or fatigue. Design and construction or conversion related issues are most likely to be in the hull structure during this period. To reduce the possibility of missing cracks, the shipbuilder, class of airs, ship owner, operator, um, through visual inspections and an NDE can hopefully identify any flaws. But ships are complex and very large welded structures and it's difficult to manufacture them without introducing some structural blind spots. There will be some sort of flaw, notch, discontinuity or stress concentration. The normal procedure followed once cracks are detected during inspection is that they are gouged and re-welded followed by non-destructive examination. Okay, so we're going on to the, to the problem with the, with the side shell cracks okay. uh, as an example. So ship structures are subject to cyclical stresses due to wave pressure, ship motions, loading conditions during operation and fatigue is important design criteria while designing and building ships. Um, the science of cracks is really important as well. Uh, forensic investigators and class of airs. For instance, on the slide you can see in front of you, um, there's a defect crack locations are in the aft portion of the hull of this vessel, which was the original section. So this is a vessel that's been lengthened. Backing brackets were not installed in way of the side shell during the conversion or new build. So on the left hand side uh, image, you can see where the transverse bulkhead meets the longitudinal side shell cracks have formed. The cracks originally appeared at the bulb collar plate weld connection on the aft side of the bulkhead. Backing brackets were fitted during the repair. An existing temporary doubler repair was put in place. As you can see here, these are photographs of where the crack has formed through the longitudinal stiffener that's attached to the side shell. And the cracks were drill stopped um, in the side shell to stop propagation. So how do we go about repairing cracks in the side shell? With an SPS solution, as you can see in this uh, image, the doublers were in place with a new longitudinal sectional stiffener. On the outside to stop the ingress of water through the cracks, a MECO match was applied. Then we marked out on the longitudinal stiffener a line to be cut to try and remove the doubler to gain access through the temporary solution to assess if the cracks had grown since the temporary solution was put in place. So we removed the upper doubler plate and lower doubler plate. In the center images, you can see we removed the wooden bungs that were in place at the uh, aft end of the uh, crack arresters. We fitted new brass plugs and we trimmed them flush to the side shell plating. We then ground the cracks to create a smooth open profile. After which, looking face on to the side shell from the inside, you can see over three bays is what we call it, where the cracks are identified with orange and the new stiffener has been, a section has been removed as donated by the, by the green. So then we install SPS. We need to surface prepare the area back to 60 microns. So we prepare that and clean it. We apply moisture tolerant sealant and structural sealant over the cracks to stop any moisture coming through. We fit and tack backing bars, as you can see in red, around the perimeter of the area, including top and bottom of the web frame. Once that's in place, we then position plates on top of those backing bars, creating a seal cavity. Once the seal and the welds have been put into position, you have one formed cavity where the cracks are now inside Although behind the longitudinal stiffeners, they're inside that seal cavity. SPS polyurethane then is injected 
from the bottom of the cavity and fills the space between the new plates that are in position and the hull where the cracks have formed. Why was SPS chosen? And what was it chosen for? SPS was uh, chosen to um, strengthen the area so the cracks wouldn't grow. With the fracture assessment and FEA, we calculate assuming that the diesel tank where the cracks were uh, was full and the fatigue assessment was performed of dynamic external pressure for the loaded condition of load cycles for 20 years. The calculated dynamic pressure corresponds to the large stress range during the service life of 20 years. By using SPS, the stress range decreased by 95% compared to how the side shell will be without any stiffening. The fatigue life is calculated to be 2,116 years after the SPS repair has been installed. So with the class society interface, they said the cracks were close to the transverse bulkhead and the consequences with even a small crack rope was high. The cracks were covered by an SPS panel. Class one to ensure that the crack could not grow uncontrolled for period during inspections. Class calculations showed that SPS panel between the existing stiffeners contributed to low stress level in the cracks and the fatigue analysis showed low probability of further crack growth. The application for steel parts of the SPS solution, a review of the drawings checked if material select was acceptable with respect to manufacturing method, weldability and material testing. The drawing review also covered acceptable details according to the rules for fabrication and testing of offshore structures. Second case that I've brought to attention is the Aframax double hull tanker crack. This crack was near the inner side skin knuckle uh, in one of the cargo tanks on the Aframax uh, tanker. In addition to a conventional pair, it was added SPS on top over the knuckle for the entire length of the tank. The objective of the SPS was to reduce stress levels at the joint and also to provide an additional barrier between the oil tank and the adjacent ballast tank, adding an extra margin of safety against oil entering the ballast tank. So the solution to assess the service life fatigue performance of the knuckle joint. The structure analysis was carried out. The effectiveness of the SPS repair was investigated through finite element analysis using two models to represent the as-built structure with SPS. The use of SPS as a permanent repair is effective because it reduces the stress levels at the knuckle joint. But a conservative assessment of 25% reduction stresses at critical locations. So the fatigue life is improved by approximately 2.4 times. This, uh, I put this in, uh, this presentation is going to be uh, available for some of these connection details for the Aframax double hull tanker crack and how SPS was attached to the side shell using the perimeter bars as a fully welded solution. Some photographs of the installation team, as you can see the scale inside the tank, um, the SPS panel on over the, going over the knuckle joint there. Since that time, regular inspections, there's been no reoccurrence of the cracking that we're aware of. This solution was also installed on three other uh, sister vessels. The ICE Class 1A super vessel, we repaired the cracked bulkhead plating. This project was brought to our attention by Lloyd's Register in 2013, following their discussions with the client regarding a life expectancy study of this already 22 year old ICE Class uh, vessel. The repair of the cracked bulkhead plating between the wing water ballast spaces and centerline fuel oil tanks. No single use can be attributed to any cracks that occurred on the ship, as I mentioned before, and, and there's multiple um, or, or, or various amounts of, of issues that can cause the cracks. Cracking appears to be a result of a number of factors compounded by the relatively long and continuous service in severe operating environments. Even new build vessels, when they're moving into um, Ice, vest, ice regions, polar regions, um, due to the difference in temperature can experience cracking. The purpose of the SPS insulation was to inhibit future crack propagation, as well as eliminate the possibility of cross contamination in the event of crack propagating through the full thickness of the bulkhead plating. And I've been shown the, the drawings there for reference. The cruise ship, we had a crack in the alleyway on deck seven. The photographs, as you can see here, this is a, a close-up view. Um, and this is uh, above the doorway itself. So the crack had propagated on both sides um, and SPS was 
uh, installed to reduce the stress in that area and stop further crack propagation. So we didn't want the, the crack coming back after the repair was installed. A 40 millimeter PU core of SPS was installed for this application. For Roro ramps, we've had several passenger Roro ferries uh, with tilting ramps that experience cracking of the welds and plating at the point of attachment of the channel stiffener to the ramp plating, and it's all related to fatigue. They've been welded as initial temporary repair, but a longer, more permanent solution was needed because it kept on cracking. The transverse flecking of the deck tends to open up one side of fillet welding joint causing tensile stresses. There was substantial cracking. We did the finite element analysis and modeling and uh, it was due to the truck wheels where they were on, on the ramp. So we installed SPS with a 20 millimeter core and gives long-term solution, permanent class approved solution to the structural fatigue problem. FE analysis was used to assess the fatigue stress range. The tensile stress at the critical details were reduced from 155 megapascals to 22 megapascals by the addition of the SPS. The fatigue life of the structure as manifested by this detail is increased from just a few years to lasting the remaining life of the ship. For installation purposes, when we talk about SPS, I'll just show a little video here that I can talk you through about how SPS is installed. This is a sample row row deck using SPS overlay. We're taking one small section at the moment. The existing deck is ba blasted back um, to original steel. Any holes are closed off using closing plates. In this case, we can reposition um, even lashing pots. Around the outside of the cavity, we weld perimeter bars to the existing deck, creating a boundary. In this instance, We've installed lashing pots to the center of the cavity and spacers to stop the plate from sagging into the cavity itself. The cavity size is possibly 10 meters by two meters. Top plate is welded to the perimeter bars, creating a cavity, creating a void inside. In each of the corners, the ventilation ports are fitted and on top of the plate to stop it bowing up under injection and remaining flat, we put some beams that are held in place. A two-part chemical mixture is um, mixed at the lowest point of the cavity. Once it enters the cavity, it takes a few minutes to fill, and then after 10-15 minutes, it solidifies, bonding the new top plate to the old, worn um, bottom plate. In some cases, the uh, old, worn bottom plate has corroded down to 50%. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? I do now see one from Christoph uh, on the chat line. It says, the question is, how do you deal with the inspection? Uh, so the second part of the question was uh, that the severity needs to inspect it every five years. Is that right? Yeah. So for, in, uh -huh, for instance, on a uh, hull uh, crack, um, the crack can be inspected from the outside um, to make sure that it's not grown. Um, but in areas where, for instance, in a fuel oil tank, um, the inspection uh, can't, be ta can't take place uh, through the SPS. You'd have to take place from the other side of where the crack has formed um, using non-destructive uh, examination. Okay. Okay, there's a question now from Nina Lilly. Okay, Nina, go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, Ian. Thank you for, for the very informative presentation. My, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, for some reason, I, uh, my screen's frozen, so I don't know if you can see me. No, I can't see you. Uh, I have a, a few questions. What the basic materials do you use for skins? Capstan like what or woven robing, Kevlar? I, I know you're using um, you're using polyurethane core. What about the skins? What do you generally use? 
Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Uh, for uh, SPS in particular, um, you generally use the same material that the existing uh, plating is made out of. Now, that's not uh, for um, a blanket statement. There are some special projects where we have used stainless steel and we've used aluminium. For instance, in the an FPSO that's operating in the North Sea, a new build a number of years ago, uh, the enhanced oil recovery tanks um, were lined with SPS and they were carbon steel tanks, but they were lined with SPS uh, using a stainless steel top plate. So the polyurethane core stays, is, is, is the common um, material, but the steel either side, the, the plates either side, um, generally 90% of what we put on, if it's a row row deck, we put, put on the same material that the SPS is going on to. Uh, you, you're using poly, polyurethane core, right? Correct, and yeah. They, the skins will be, of course, whatever material is the best that you're undergoing modification, correct? So correct. If it's, if it's aluminum, it will be aluminum. So if it's steel, it will be steel between uh, two, and then on the center is your core, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, as, as a sandwich. As a sandwich, yeah, the sandwich plate system. SPS it stands for sandwich plate system, yeah. Um, as I said, that that that's right for ninety percent, ninety five percent of our projects. Uh, there are some exceptions where you will have two different types of uh, steel materials, such as carbon steel and stainless steel. And uh, the polyurethane acts as a barrier between the two. Okay, thanks, Nina. Thanks very much, uh, Ian. Thank you. A question from Jonathan Morley. Uh, he says it is noted that. Um, an epoxy which comes in contact with the liquid. The, uh, you use an epoxy which comes in contact with the liquid. Are there any problems with such chemicals such as ethanol? No, uh, we have done extensive material testing over uh, the last 20 years. I think it's something like 12,000 independent tests and we have a material characterization report where SPS is subjected to uh, submersion or interaction with uh, a lot of um, other products such as ethanol, um, you know, SPS is essentially inert and provides um, a center barrier. So if you look at SPS, the sandwich plate system, you've got the existing steel, in most cases, uh, brand new steel plate plus the polyurethane core. So that's a triple barrier. If one of the plates fails for whatever reason, um, uh, you know, down the line, uh, the polyurethane core itself acts as a barrier. So there's an interesting uh, question on on, on being a barrier, for instance, it can also act as a thermal barrier where um, for some vessels we have heavy fuel oil tanks, uh, but they don't have the capacity to have marine gas oil uh, on board. So they try to convert uh, one of the heavy fuel oil tanks into marine gas oil um, to increase their cargo carrying capacity, but they would usually have to put in a uh, coffer dam space, uh, essentially. Um, that would require inspection. But with SPS, you can just align that existing bulkhead that shares heavy fuel oil on one side and marine gas oil on the other side need to be stored at different temperatures. The polyurethane core will provide that thermal break in between uh, the two different tanks. Okay, thanks Ian. Another question that's come in from Mike Monaghan and it's the commercial side. What is the relative cost of SPS repair versus a renewal in kind? Um, for the maritime market, we are cost competitive, we're cost comparative essentially, um, mainly down to the fact that over large areas, we're actually four times quicker. So your vessel doesn't uh, stay uh, alongside <laughs> for long periods. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you need to get it back to sea earning, earning money. Um, for instance, say uh, a single hull bulk uh, carrier, maybe 600 square meters coming alongside, can whole tank top can have SPS uh, installed in about 10 days, um, which is which is really good. Um, but for the offshore side of things, if, if you were looking at oil rigs, uh, pipe rack decks and pontoons, uh, below the waterline repairs uh, and, and, and stuff like that, you're you're talking maybe 10, 11 times cheaper than the alternative of having dive boats alongside or um, you know, uh, rope access guys, because you can work from the inside. And the good thing about SPS is that the existing plate stays in place, you just prepare it. So under deck um, piping, insulation, all that stuff stays in, 
in place um, and you can install SPS. We also have developed a low heat solution where we can um, install the bars to the existing plate uh, without using any welding and then we weld the top plate to the bars. We also have a, a no hot work solution where the bars are structurally adhered to the deck um, and the top plates adhere to the deck or it's bolted uh, to the bars. So there's different options. Um, we design SPS uh, on a, on a case by case basis to suit what um, the design criteria is. But, you know, we've, we've got a portfolio of, of hundreds and hundreds of projects. Um, and, you know, this is no longer a new technology. This is um, something that's a class approved permanent repair with, um, with, with longevity. Okay, the, the next question on the list um, is from Jaime Perez. Whoops, just went off the screen, hold on. Due to the anisotropic of the coal, have you experienced any issue with load transmission in any project? No, no, uh, purely because those um, criteria are known in the design phase and, and we, we take those calculations into account and then we get them verified by the Vessels Classification Society uh, before we move forward with the project. Okay, one from Nina um, said, have you had any accidents using SPS? Accidents? Uh, no, um, we, we've, we've ran many tests to, to uh, instigate uh, or recreate an accident such as a, a container um, being loaded onto a vessel uh, and becoming loose from the crane and falling on point uh, onto an SPS uh, panel. Um, and the SPS top plate will bend, but it won't go through the polyurethane core. So you still maintain your watertight integrity to sail. Um, so no, we've, we've done extensive testing where we have conducted blast tests up to 2.4 bar um, for escape tunnels for FPSOs. We've subjected our panels to um, fire tests where you know a fire underneath would be raging at 945 degrees. Um, and normal steel would lose its structural rigidity, but on an SPS panel, you could, you know, with experience, I think it's uh, 38 or 40 degrees Celsius. So um, we have not experienced any accidents with SPS, but we tried to recreate um, worst case scenarios in order to pass testing. Yes, I know. Uh, well, uh, Chris, Christoph Palliser says, you mentioned uh, no hot work when it's bolted, but uh -huh. it's considered as hot work perhaps uh in some areas yeah yeah no he's he, he's right um in the offshore world um definitely uh drilling grinding surface preparation uh wire wheels can be considered as uh, as as hot work um we would we would take that into account and and if it was a complete hazard zone for instance um then we would just use structural adhesive and make the panels a little bit smaller and, and join them together what's great about sps in in relation to uh, other composite materials is that one SPS panel can be joined to another SPS panel to another one. So you can just keep adding and adding and adding, and it adds to the global strength um, of, you know, a main deck or a lay down area. There's no break, you know, it's it, uh, other, other kind of single cavities that lay side by side, but are not connected. Don't have that top plate continuity. Okay, thanks Ian. Uh, we have a hand up from, uh, I did see a hand up. I think it's from Jackie Delap. If you can, if you can unmute Jackie. Hello. Can you hear me now? Hello. Uh, uh, good evening, Ian. Jack good evening. Jack Delap here in Lloyd's Register. Um, after installation of the SPS, how do you verify the internal integrity of the uh, polyurethane core in a similar manner that in bolded uh, structures we carry out volumetric examination by carrying out NDE. Uh -huh. So we go through uh, an extensive uh, quality assurance uh, process when we're installing SPS. So we, we, we aim for um, uh, surface profile is 60 microns, so that gives the polyurethane in its liquid format, uh, a anchor profile to, to bite in uh, to the steel and uh, it goes, once it goes from a liquid to a solid, it pulls the two 
steel plates together um, acting as one. Um, before we do the injections, we check the humidity by, uh, inside the panel by blowing dry air through it. Um, in, in, the, in the animation, you saw the ventilation ports that we have. We actually collect a sample of the polyurethane that has passed through the cavity, wait till it solidifies, and then we do short D hardness tests on it. Um, so there's a set of criteria that we have to make sure that um, the environment inside the cavity is um, as as good as you know our quality control process um, states. So, for instance, um, when we're forming the cavity, we can also use uh, NDE by MPI or on the welding on the externals. Um, we do actually put a leak test um, on the cavity as well to make sure the polyurethane has liquid format doesn't go through a, a weld that's not uh, not 100 percent so there's 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 a whole raft of uh, quality assurance steps that we need to take during the injection process uh, curing process and 24 hours after as well uh, is is uh, ultrasonic examination possible to verify the uh, presence of any internal defects on the cured polyurethane core afterwards? Um, I'm not sure. I know that a company in Canada, we're, 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 we're developing something, but I don't, we don't, we haven't used it in the field. What we use is um, uh, just essentially um, a tap test or acoustic test to see if the panel is full. But because we've got ventilation ports in uh, each of the corners of the panel or in uh, tricky areas to allow all the air to escape, and once all the air is escaped and pushing against gravity and pumped out, uh, the polyurethane comes after it, and then you know that the that the cavity is full itself. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe during the mock-up simulations or or, or the uh, testing carried out before it has been applied, um, various uh, test cases have been found in order to check the integrity of the polyurethane core, uh, although the controlled quality process will uh, ensure that uh, any defects may be avoided during the process of installation. Realistically, uh, we can always assume or expect uh, certain porosities or, or some, some forms of defects which may have occurred during the installation. My question is, um, have you also carried out any crack propagation studies on the polyurethane core to ensure that even if there is any existing defects, it will not propagate to a critical length or, or depth such that uh, the integrity of the whole SPS panel uh, is assured. Yes, yeah, yeah. We, we have carried out tests um, in conjunction with uh, universities in, in, in Canada, um, um, destructive tests as well. Um, I wasn't involved in the, that, that testing, but you know, as I say, it, it's um, we've done twelve thousand independent tests, and, and, and including shear, tension, um, fatigue, cracking, impact, um, blast, and fire protection. Um, so those those tests have been carried out. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that, Ian. Okay. No problem. Thank, thank you, Jackie. I have um, a few more questions. Uh, we're on a roll now, Ian. Um, All right. Th th there's one from Simon Pollard. Uh, and he says, I think the development of SPS over the years has been fascinating, but it seems to have stayed as an overlay system primarily. Back in the day, intelligent engineering was looking at the material as a new build construction material, and Lloyd's Register were developing rules to do so. You mentioned a thermal barrier. It was also being considered for vibration reduction and for ballistic protection. How has that work developed? Very good question. Um, yes, uh, back uh, when the company was known as Intelligent Engineering, um, testing was, was carried out for, for new ship building, um, specifically in, in hatch covers, etc., because it uh, uh, reduced the complexity of the hatch cover build. Um, and obviously with the triple barrier, if the hatch cover top got damaged, um, the polyurethane would maintain um, watertight integrity to sale and um, the the ship building side of things um due to market conditions i, I think if, if, if we're honest um uh, didn't didn't take off um it's not a, an area that we're discounting but it's not an area that we're focusing on at the moment um thermal barrier as we mentioned because the polyurethane's got a great k value for um 
for, for, for that and the vibration dampening. We completed a project um, not too long ago for a brand new build vessel uh, operating in the Mediterranean uh, where the propeller was cavitating and sending vibrations through the stern of the vessel and up into the passenger cabins. Um, so it was an unusual one because we generally work on vessels that uh, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, are kind of in their midlife to, to the last 10 years uh, where fatigue and corrosion are, are adding to the cracks uh, situation. But in this case, it was a brand new vessel um, and we had to install SPS to stop the, well, to reduce the vibrations. It was acting as a vibration dampener um, through the hull of the vessel. And that was installed um, while the vessel was um, in operation. So um, that was a, a fantastic um, benefit for the for the client because we have a partners who have riding squads of just four or five guys that can go on board the vessel while it's in operation and install the SPS. Because it was below the waterline and inside the vessel uh, on the hull, we welded the top plate to the uh, internal stiffeners. So the stiffeners themselves formed the cavity, like in the presentation I showed you with the side shelf because it was below the waterline. Um, we didn't want to do any water back welding procedures. So we welded the top plate to the stiffeners 25 millimeters away as standard. So there's no heat transfer through to the uh, hull itself, damage coatings, et cetera. And then we inject the polyurethane in between the new plate and the, the existing hull without um, any, uh, any impact on, on the vessel itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, another one from Christoph Pelissou. Um Is there a maximum service te temperature? Uh, that the uh, SPS can work with? I guess um, maximum or minimum, I guess. Max and min temperatures. Yeah. Is it working? Well, there's two, two ways to look at that question. Is it an installation question? Is there a maximum minimum temperature, environmental temperature that we can install SPS? Um, we have installed SPS in um, extremely hot climates um, and extremely cold climates. If it's in the cold climate, then we need to take other precautions like making sure the polyurethane is uh, kept at a constant temperature before it's injected in its two-part chemical or mixture. Um, the operating temperature, there are upper and lower limits. Um, I am unsure off the top of my head where they are um, ranging. I'd have to, I'd have to get, I'd have to take the the email address and, and get back to you on that one. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to quote a figure right now. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but 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 also we do design SPS um, to the design criteria. So you know, if it if it needs to be cold, we'll design it to be cold. If it needs to be hot, we'll design it to be hot. So um, yeah, we we can. We can we can work around those uh, uh, temperatures, but installation wise, we've operated all over the world um, and uh, sub zero temperatures to, you know, in the hottest summer in Dubai, uh, personally, or even in, in Egypt, uh, installing SPS. So the installation wise, it's not an issue. Service life, um, we are looking at, um, we've actually got class approval for uh, putting SPS on the outside of a vessel to upgrade it uh, for ice class um, rating. So usually if you want to upgrade a, a, an ice class vessel, you have to maybe remove the bow, put a lot of internal structure members, uh, framing um, and stiffeners, uh, where with SPS, um, you don't need as much as that. And you can put SPS on the outside and to, and obviously down midships as well. Um, on the bow, it's thicker than it is in midships. Um, but we've, we've, We've got uh, class approval documents for and drawings for that application because they're obviously going to uh, operate in uh, very low temperature uh, areas, polar temperature areas. Okay, I'm going to go slightly technical on you now, Ian. Um, this is a question from James Robson. And he asks, how does an SPS panel compare to the original steel panel? Does it have any downsides in comparison, such as shear or tension capacity? And is the poly core vulnerable to delamination with direct tension loading through the core? Good question. Good question. Um, for instance, for, for start off, let, let's look at the construction of an SPS panel. So uh, an SPS panel, um, uh, say three meters by four meters or, or three, two meters by 10 meters. Um, if you have uh, a conventional build sheet steel, you will need the primary stiffeners, but you need SPS anyway uh, to put the 
position the perimeter bars on, but you'll need an awful lot of secondary stiffening underneath that sheet steel plate, whereas you do not need any secondary stiffeners um, for the equivalent SPS panel, shall we say, because inside the two uh, face plates of polyurethane, if you imagine the SPS polyurethane acts as a, a million tiny stiffeners anyway. Um, so in way of performance of uh, design build, an SPS panel is less complex, uses less material for, you don't need the secondary stiffening. Um, in way of tension loads, um, again, it, it's down to the design. Um, we've passed all you know tests to say that uh, SPS is superior to flat plate steel, but you can you can design it to be that way. Um, it's like interpreting statistics. It can be um, open to interpretation for whoever's putting it forward. Okay, and uh, the last question on my chat box is for, again from Nina, who was obviously still con worried about FRP. Has there been any application whatsoever using any SPS system on FRP vessels? Um, I'd have to go back through the portfolio. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Can't answer that one. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Oh, she'll be chasing you. Don't worry. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> um, that's the last of the questions on the chat box, and I don't see any other hands uh, up. Uh, oh, one's just come up again. It's Jackie Delup. So. Final question, Jackie. Yeah, it's a, I hope it's a final question. Um, just going back to uh, the the statement uh, regarding uh, using the SPS on an ice squash vessel. Um, is that is that applied to upgrade a non class ice non ice class vessel to an ice class vessel, or upgrading an already existing ice ice class vessel to a higher ice class vessel? The 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 uh, project that I speak about during this presentation was upgrading an existing uh, ice class vessel to a higher ice class rating. Um, but we see uh, again through design criteria, we, we don't see any issues. Should we need to upgrade a um, non ice class vessel to a ice class rating using SPS? And it's it's down to the thickness of the steel and the thickness of the polyurethane core and you know, whatever um, internal stiffening may be required to achieve that. Um, we have had inquiries from our client base um, of, of, of late, um, coming up to winter time. Usually you get a, a flurry of activity uh, for ice class um, vessels. Um, but yes, the, the, the one I refer to is an existing ice class vessel, but it's up, up, um, upgraded to a higher ice class rating. But thanks for the clarification, Ian, because I asked the question because if it was to be uh, used for uh, um, strengthening a non-ice class vessel to say an ice class 1E or, or, or 1D, if it's non ice class, I would expect that the uh, distance of the framing is already uh, wider. But the practicality of using an, an, an SPS, basically putting that skin on, on the outside or the, the center part of the hull, uh, you, you, will, you will still need to probably put additional mid stiffeners in order to satisfy the strengthening requirements as well as the, uh, the rules. Vessels, every vessel is different, but I, I, I agree with your statement. I think uh, for a non ice class vessel to be upgraded, just using SPS on the outside, some structural modifications will be provided, would, would be needed in the bow section. Not sure about midships, but definitely in the bow section. Okay. Thanks for that, yeah. While well, we've had uh, Jackie's question, we've got two more on the chat line. What is the maximum time an SPS system has been used on one vessel from Jonathan Morley? Um, I think it was, but SPS is designed to last the life of the vessel. So I'm thinking 15 years it was a tank top. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we have a question from Steve Dart. What are the failure speeds for SPS? Does it fail catastrophically or is there a warning like in most cases for steel? 
Um, it's pretty difficult to answer that because not, we, only, we only replicate failures in testing. We haven't uh, experienced um, failures as such in, uh, in service. So that's a difficult one to, I'm trying to think back if there's any operating outside the design criteria, maybe. Um, repair procedure is pretty, pretty straightforward by cutting the top plate uh, in the localized um, defect area and uh, removing the solid polyurethane, putting in a new section of SPS top plate and then re-injecting the polyurethane in its liquid format and it will solidify inside that uh, section of the cavity. So liquid polyurethane um, adheres to solid polyurethane perf seamlessly, perfectly. So the repair procedure is not uh, not complicated, but I'm trying to think back to have we had any any issues? Um, and I can't outside testing. Okay, good. I think that concludes the questions, Ian. I think we've had a very good uh, Q&A session there. Obviously, it's uh, generated a lot of interest uh, as your uh, presentation. So we, we thank you for that. I thank, on behalf of everybody attending, we've had a good attendance. So we, I thank you um, from everybody.